Greetings, salutations, fellow developers. It is your boy, Chili. Welcome back to Chill Framework. And look where we at here. We're not in our experimental branch. We are here at Master because today I'm actually going to do something I haven't done in a long time, a video that is part of the official timeline of the Chill Framework series. Yes. We are finally adding something that is not experimental. Uh, what is it? So as you know, I've been doing a lot of, you know, developing R&D on the graphics subsystem, the back end. And um, what I found is on all the testing, I've been having to recompile the program every time to change some values here, change some values there. It's very annoying. I want a CLI, a command line interface that I can use for benchmarking and for testing. I, I can't live without it any longer. Now, in my day job, which I also do C++ programming in, I created a very nice system that is built on a popular open source library. And uh, I want to do that here too because it's very nice and it can we can have some fun with funky C++. We're going to get deep into that C++ E. Yes. Uh, so in this video, there's going to be a few videos on this topic. In this video, we're going to look at the concept of a CLI. We're going to set up VC package so we can pull in that third party library in a very sexy manner because in the future, I want all my third party dependencies as much as possible to be pulled in with the package manager, VC package. And after we've pulled that in, we're going to explore a little bit of the basic functionality of this library that we are going to be building on top of. So I don't want to insult your intelligence. I'm sure you guys are probably familiar with a CLI, but let's just, for, for completeness sake, let's just take a look here. So in this directory here, I got a file somewhere probably called test.txt. And if I do something like notepad uh, test.txt, it's going to open up notepad. It's going to open up that file in notepad because I gave it, you know, an argument on the command line. Uh, just a direct argument. Now let's look at a different program. Let's look at the venerable presentmon. And if we give it a switch here, a, a flag on the command line, we can modify its behavior. We can tell it, no, don't do the thing you normally do. How about you spit out a list of all the available options? And here they are. And so we can see there's a bunch of different options that we could do. And some of them are switches. You just put them on there and they modify the behavior. It's like a Boolean. And some of them are options with a parameter that is associated with the option. Uh, so like if I do delay, it needs another thing, which is the number of seconds to delay for, which is going to be a number. Those are the different things you can do on the command line. I'm sure we're, we're all familiar with this concept. Uh, but what you have to do to actually implement this in your program is you got to parse those things. Like the operating system will do some work for you, like the shell and or the C runtime. I don't know who does it, but they take the string that you type in here and they split it up into a bunch of tokens for you. It's a list of tokens, but they're all separated tokens. And some of those tokens go together. Like this option delay goes with the token that follows it, which is seconds. If it exists, if it doesn't, that's a problem. Uh, and you got to validate that you got to associate those manually. When you write your program, uh, you got to validate the options that the user supplies. Do they actually exist? Is it a typo? Is it a hallucination? I don't know if they specify delay and the parameter they type is pubes, you probably got to, you know, give them a little slap on the wrist for that. That's not cool, dude. Uh, if they put like negative one seconds, that don't make no sense. I don't want to do all this bullshit of validating and parsing and associating and putting the value somewhere in, in a variable that I can then access later on in my program. I want a library to do that for me. Yes. That's what we're going to be doing. But first, let's just take a step back. Let's see what it looks like without a library. So first thing you notice here is, well, in a console application, you get, well, I didn't actually put it in here because I'm not using it, but what you get a pointer to a table of strings. Each one of those is a car pointer. Yeah. So this, let's just make sure I'm not insane. I, sh I don't think I'm insane, at least not for this reason. Uh, this should compile if I put those in here because this is, and yes, it compiles. This is normal. We know this. Um, and then I can loop through from zero to argc and I can index into this table and I can read all the strings and see what's going on. Now, here's the interesting thing 
in a wind main, you don't get arg C and arg V, you just get the raw string and you gotta like parse it yourself. You gotta raw dog that mother. And uh, I don't wanna do that. There's functions that you can call to parse it for you and all that stuff. But here's a little trick. As long as I is less than double underscore W arg C. So we got these double underscore arg C arg V and they're wide variants. And you can use those. You can use those. Okay, wargv exists. There is no wargc. Why? Because it should be the same whether it is wide or narrow, right? It doesn't make any sense to have two of them. Okay, so there you go. So I can loop through these and then I can print them out. So let's run this. Uh, look, I'm using wargv because my chillog wants wide strings and because I, this is set to be wide, I don't think it works if you try the narrow one. I think it just blows up. Uh, so don't do that, but uh, let's run this and let's see what we get spit out to our output window here and We get one thing here The thing that is logged is this line here This so this is always argument zero to your program You always have one and it is the name of your application the path to the exe basically Okay so what happens if we now give it some actual arguments? How do we do that? Well, there's a couple of ways you could do it. There's the annoying way of going into like the properties and going into debugging. And then you can type in your command line arguments in here. And every time you want to edit them, you got to edit them in this dumb text box and it's annoying. But I have a much sexier way. There's an extension called, well, let me show you what it is. It's called Smart Command Line Arguments for VS 2022, and it's very nice because it lets you put a bunch of arguments that you typically use in this list here, and then enable them and disable them at your leisure, at your pleasure. And so I make great use of this in my work and in my play. Now, if we run it with these four things all slammed together on the command line, you see, I, I give them different flavors. I give like a direct argument to the program, I give a switch. I give an option with an option argument. Uh, let's just make it like a number, like 69. There you go. A numerical option number. And then I give another option with a quoted argument to it. And if we run it like this, we see how these things actually come out to our program. So we see again what we had before the path to the executable, and then we have our direct argument as one token that we got out, and then we have the flag, and then we have the option followed by its argument. They're separated. They don't get lumped together. You got to figure that out positionally. And here's the second option, and it does lump all these together because we put it in quotes, but it removes the quotes at some point. Either the shell or the runtime removes those quotes for you. And there you go. That is what it looks like. That's what it looks like when you raw dog it. Now, like I already mentioned, that's not what we're going to do here. We are going to use the library CLI 11. Uh, now, to consume this, like I said, we're going to use VC package. So we got to set up VC package, which we haven't done that yet, although I certainly intended to do it from the beginning. So how do we do that? Well, there's a couple of ways. First, you need VC package on your system. There's two ways of doing that. You can install the independent install by following these directions, and you will have a version that is independently installed, but it also now comes together with Visual Studio. It is bundled in here, it is included, I think even by default, but when I installed it, Visual Studio 2022, it was not yet in there, so that is why on my system, I do not have the included one, I have, I have a separate standalone installation. Uh, but you can do it either way, either one works. Um, now, there are two ways of having VC package on your system. There are two ways of using VC package. You can install your packages in VC package and have them globally available to every project on the system. Only, you can only do that way, by the way, if you have a standalone installation. If you have the installation bundled with VC package, you can only use the other method, which is a manifest, which is what we're gonna do. It is a file that you put in your project in your solution, and it says this solution needs these dependencies, so when you build it, pull these in automatically and link all, link all the shit up. That's what we're gonna do. All right, so let's say you got VC package installed, it's all good, now what do you gotta do? Well, you gotta enable it for your project. If we're doing manifests, we gotta say, okay, this project needs to use 
manifest. And we'll just start by doing it in window app, but eventually it's the, maybe the core that is the one that really matters here. So first is to say use a manifest. Second is to actually add a GD manifest. Let me think here. I want to add a new item to the solution. I don't know if that's just going to work. A new solution folder. Let's just make this call it like common. Uh, let's add a new item. And we're going to call it vcpackage.json. Now, hopefully this put it in the solution root. And if you put it in here, I believe it will apply to all projects. Although, as you know, this project here is not using manifest yet. Only this one is. But uh, if we enable it for this one, this then it will use the manifest that is in the root. Okay, so manifest. It's a file. It's a JSON file. What is the format? I mean, it's JSON, obviously, but like, what are the fields? So these are the fields. The main thing is the dependency list here, and we want CLI 11. This stuff is talking about your own project. I don't even know if this is necessary, but I'm going to put it in anyways. And this one is necessary if you don't have a standalone install. If your install is the one that's included with Visual Studio, it gets very angry if you don't put this in here. What is this big thing? This is actually a commit hash in the Microsoft VC package GitHub. So, I mean, if I, if I search for this, it will actually find the commit. This is the commit that it is referencing. It is saying we want to use the state of VC package at this commit. And that determines, you know, what packages are available and all sorts of bullshit. I don't know. It does, I don't really know. I just know if it's not in here, you get it gets very angry at you. So let's just put it in there. Uh, so now we have this in here. We set this project up to say, hey, use a, use a manifest, you heathen. And now if we build it, it's going to do stuff. It's going to say, hey, you said you need some stuff from VC Package. I'm going to pull that in for you. I'm going to build it for you. I'm going to link it to your project. So now it's done. What does that mean? What do we get? Well, it's magic. It's like magic. It is magic. Include CLI. Hey, what happened to my magic? Okay, it's quasi magic. I had to turn visual, I had to close Visual Studio and open it again. But now when I type pound sign includes CLI, put a little slash there, I've got access to the thing that was pulled in somewhere, wherever it is. We'll look at that later. So let's include CLI.HPP. It seems like a little, no, it's, it's happy. It's chilling. It's just straight chilling here. So this is what we got to do. We got to create an app object. Then we can add an option. We bind that option to a variable where it'll be parsed into. And then we call CLI parse to actually parse the command line. We pass it our argc and our argv and the app that we configured. Okay, seems simple enough. All right, sweet. I set it up, make my app, make my option variable, bind it in here, give it a name. And Bob is your uncle. There's one problem, and that is this will definitely blow up because we're using the narrow argv but we're using a wide win main so we gotta we gotta we gotta make ourselves a little narrow because um, cli it doesn't like the wide boys so we'll just do that we'll do that we will build it should build now all right it builds without errors although there is a warning inside the validators here now i i should probably print out the option that we get so there we go. I define my app, I configure the set of options, I parse the command line, and then I try to access the results. If we look in our logging here, we see we did get the option. It says morb, and we put morb in there. If we were to not do that, and also put a breakpoint here, because I don't want to see those windows, we get default, because nothing was set. The option was not present on the command line. Now, if you want option one to be an integer, it's very easy. You just make it an int. And, um, well, you don't do that. We'll make the default like negative one. Format it for logging. If we run that, we see the option that was passed in as a string was parsed into an integer, and then we were able to format it out back to a string. Wonderful. We round trip that mother. We can create another variable as a bool and add that as a flag. It doesn't take any arguments, it's just a flag. We'll put that, print that out, and when then we do that, now we see 420 and true because I did supply flag A, but if I don't supply it, we get 420 false. Interesting. We can even give our flag a short name like A. And now if we just supply a single tick and A, what do we expect to see? We expect to see a true. You could do either. You could do the long one. You could do the short one. 
What the hell? Why are you making a liar out of me? What did I do wrong here? Did you put the eight? Ah, I didn't check it. That makes sense. If I check it, then it's true. There you go. Now let me show you another cool thing that this gives us. I'll add another flag, flag B. Give it its short name. You can combine short flags into a single thing, like A, B. We'll turn them both on. Well, it helps if you actually type the right name in when you're copy-pasting. But yeah, now you see true, true. Because this short one has, I've combined A and B together. Very nice. And I could go on and on. There's like a ton of options for customizing the validation of these things. Um, but we want to move on and I'll, I will show the other features as we incorporate them into our CLI framework. Now this is a nice enough demonstration, but it ain't really what we're looking for. Uh, when we have a CLI system like this, we generally want the, the arguments to be available system-wide globally. Uh, and I like to keep them together. So I'd like to make like a global struct and put all these in there. And I won't I won't, usually it goes in its own file and you can include it into any of the source files that need to access the command line arguments. But for the purpose of this demonstration, I'll just put it in global scope up here. All right, so what you might end up doing is something like this. You create like a structure, CLI args, you put all of your variables in there that you're gonna bind and you make it global. And then you can, you know, you can put your app in here too. And in the constructor of this thing, you can configure it, you can do all the binding, and you can call the parse function since you don't even, like these are globally available. I think that works, we'll, we'll try. Now one thing that doesn't work here is that this macro is actually trying to return a value. If there's a parse error, it's gonna to try to return an error code, but we don't want that. So let's, let's expand this macro in line, and if we catch an error, if we catch an error, we'll log it and then we'll terminate the whatever, it doesn't matter. So if we run this, we get 420 true true. So it's working, it's working fine, it's beautiful. This is a lot better, we could, you know, we'd probably move this into the CPP file. The header would just have the structure with these members and you include it anywhere you want. You can access those members, it's a beautiful thing. But, you know, it, something about it just rubs me wrong. Can you guess what it is? It, it's sort of, this thing always rubs me wrong. So whenever I want to add a new option in here, like if I want to add flag C, I got to add it in here. But I also have to remember to add it in here. Flag C, flag C, and don't, don't, when you copy paste, don't forget to change all the C's, the B's to C's. Um, if I change one of these names, if I decide to change my name, I might go into here and change it, but forget to change it in here or vice versa. And uh, these are all things that happen, and I don't like it. I like to avoid it if possible. What my ideal is, I wanna just be able to add an option in the struct here, and it automatically picks it up and configures the app, does everything automatically. So I only have one, a single source of truth. I don't have to keep two different things in sync with each other. And it is possible because I have done it, and we're gonna do it in our logging framework here, but that is gonna be for the next video. Until then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, please click the like button, it helps a lot. And I will see you again with some chill framework.